So an important meeting wrapped up at the Vatican last week. It was called the Synod on Synodality. Hundreds of church leaders from all over the world spent a month talking about who we are as Catholics and where we are headed. Pope Francis called this meeting because he acknowledges that we need to do a better job communicating our message to ourselves and to the world. You may remember last year being invited to complete a survey for the Synod or participating in a listening session. Your comments from these surveys and listening sessions and those of other ordinary Catholics across the globe were gathered together in preparation for the October meeting and people from the church, some ordained and some lay Catholics, were chosen to attend the Synod and represent our views. One of the Synod participants, Father James Martin, wrote an article in America Magazine about his experience at the Synod and about how much different this Synod was than past Synods. One of my favorite quotes from the article probably because I have three adult daughters who are themselves cynical about the church, described the requirement that every participant of the synod treat every other participant equally, with the same respect, regardless of their status. Martin wrote, no one could interrupt and everyone had to listen. That meant that the cardinal archbishop of an ancient archdiocese listened to a 19-year-old college student from Wyoming, or the patriarch or primate of a country listened to a woman theology professor. No interruptions, responses, or talkbacks. But, Martin added, that he was also at tables where a facilitator had to say to a cardinal, Cardinal, she hasn't finished yet. So why did we need this synod now? Well, in part because of the cynicism of people like my daughters and others. There is a perception both inside and outside of the church that we Catholics aren't always consistent in what we say and in what we do. Another word for that is hypocrisy. And it doesn't just happen in churches. Hypocrisy can happen in our families, our workplaces, our schools, and our country. This is week four of our message series, Hard Questions. In the series, we have been exploring hard questions that believers and non-believers alike have about God, faith, and the church. By exploring and answering these questions, we have been identifying ways that we can deepen our faith so that others are drawn to God's kingdom through our word and example. This week, we are exploring the question, are Christians hypocrites? In today's gospel, Jesus speaks to the religious leaders of his day and to us about this very question. Jesus tells his followers that they should give proper deference to the scribes and the Pharisees because they were the religious leaders of his day, similar to our bishops and cardinals. But he cautions them that although they should do as the religious leaders say, they should not do as they do. For they preach, but they do not practice. They tie up heavy burdens hard to carry and lay them on people's shoulders, but they will not lift a finger to move them. All their works are performed to be seen. Jesus is calling the religious leaders out as hypocrites because they say one thing and do another. They were trying to draw attention to themselves so that everyone might believe that they are more holy because of their appearance. Jesus is warning his disciples to not be like the scribes and the Pharisees in today's gospel, as if to say to them, when one day you lead my church, do not draw attention to yourselves by your outward, outward appearance. What matters most is not what you say or how you present yourself. What matters most is what you do and how you do it. Jesus says, as for you, do not be called rabbi. You have but one teacher and you are all brothers. Call no one on earth your father. 
You have but one Father in heaven. Do not be called master. You have one, but one master, the Christ. The greatest among you must be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, but whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Sixty years ago, the church held a meeting in Rome similar to the Synod on Synodality, although much bigger, to respond to similar contradictions within the church and in society. Although the meeting participants at Vatican II were not as diverse and the voting members were only bishops and cardinals and no lay Catholics, the attendees for the first time spoke of our universal call to holiness, recognizing for the first time that each of us is called to be holy, not just the ordained, and that each of us is responsible for our own individual faith and holiness. Prior to this meeting, Catholics mostly relied on priests and religious to carry the weight, to make them holy. Prior to the meeting, the church had given the lay faithful what was in effect a checklist taken from the Baltimore Catechism or a similar source which, which, in which they told them that they needed, what they needed to do to be holy. Attend mass on Sunday and holy days, pray regularly and before meals, go to confession, etc. But this checklist mostly just addressed what we could do outwardly for others to see. Years later, we discovered that many Catholics, including unfortunately many priests, although following the checklist and outwardly appearing holy, were not actually living by Jesus' example in their private lives. Many of them, including many very high-ranking priests, bishops, and even a cardinal or two, were being hypocrites just like the religious leaders we read about in today's gospel. They were not being humble, as Jesus said they should be at the end of today's gospel. Pope Francis very wisely decided to humble the religious leaders of our own time and force them to be synodal, to listen to and respect lay religious leaders of the church who, like them, have equally been called to holiness in whatever their particular station is in life, and through whom the Holy Spirit also speaks. This is a very positive development for our church. We should and we must pray for the success of the Synod, that the Holy Spirit will breathe life into the church through the ordained and the lay participants of the Synod. But I do not mean to be overly harsh toward religious leaders, which, by the way, includes me. Jesus was not speaking only to them in today's gospel. Early in my FBI career, a witness told me that the target of my investigation had spoken to the, the, the witness and that, that the target knew that I was investigating him. He also somehow knew that I was Catholic like him. The target, who did not know me, told my uh, witness, I'm sure Special Agent Doyle is like all Catholics. They act pious and moral, but in their personal lives, they are not. They do whatever they want, lie, cheat, steal, and then they just go to confession and pretend for themselves that the, the, word, the world, pretend to themselves and the world that they are something that they are not. And then they lie, cheat, and steal again and start the cycle all over again. Although the target didn't even know me, this statement dug into me. It made me search my soul and ask myself if what he said was true. Am I and are all Catholics hypocrites? Do we live our faith even when people who know us are not watching? Or are we unkind, unforgiving? Do we hold grudges? Do we insult others and talk about them behind their backs? Are we judgmental and stingy as Father Mike mentioned last week in his homily. Author Brennan Manning once observed, the greatest single cause of atheism in the world today is Christians, who acknowledge Jesus with their lips, walk out the door and deny him by their lifestyle. That is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. So am I a hypocrite? Are you a hypocrite? This is a truly harsh and hard question. But the answer, as Brennan Manning points out, matters 
so much in our world. We can hold synods, we can talk about social and theological issues and about the structure of the church, but if we do not live our faith with integrity, none of that matters. We each know, and Jesus knows, what is in our hearts and souls. He knows, and we know, if we are truly trying to live up to his expectations of us. And he knows, and we know, when we fall short. Only we can answer this hard question, am I even sometimes a hypocrite? I've reflected a lot on this question over the years since I heard the accusation from my witness, and I've concluded that indeed sometimes I have been a hypocrite. And I suspect that many of you have been too. I've not always lived up to the standard I have set for myself as a follower of Christ, or what people believe I should be as a Christian, a Catholic, and a deacon. But I've also concluded that most of the time, I do live up to Jesus' expectations and the expectations of others with his help. And that what really matters, as Jesus prescribes at the end of today's gospel, is that we are all humble and recognize that we are flawed human beings and that we must continually struggle to do our best to love and follow him. In the end, we must be honest with ourselves and honest with God. And as long as we are genuinely and humbly trying to live with integrity in what we say and in what we do, I believe we are not hypocrites. My friend, FBI chaplain Father Tom Nangle, used to often say, we are all in the same leaky boat crossing the sea of life together, helping each other to get across. This week, and each week between now and the final meeting of the Synod on Synodality, next October. I invite you to pray for the ordained and lay participants representing us at the Synod. Pray that they will continue to be open to each other and to the Holy Spirit. I also invite you to reflect this week on your own faith and holiness. Ask yourself, am I living with integrity, humbly following Jesus' example? Does the way I live my life when others are not watching match the person people see here at church and in my public life. As long as we and all Christians are truly and humbly, with God's help, genuinely trying to live our faith with honesty and integrity, we are not hypocrites. We are just humble followers of Christ in the same leaky boat, helping each other to cross the sea of life.